joining me on the panel today, um, Shiminda Nahal from Channel 4, Katie Metcalf at the other end from Nowness, and next to Shiminda we have Alex Hoffman from uh, Vice, and Mark Bell from the BBC. Um, just a quick intro about everyone. Um, Shiminda, specialist factual commissioning editor at Channel 4, is responsible for arts and topical. She's overseen the critically acclaimed series Grace and Perry Rites of Passage and Super Kids Breaking Away from Care with Lem Sisse, both nominated for Factors. She commissioned Akram Khan's The Curry House Kid and also the film 100 Vaginas. She looks after the artist in residence strand, Random Acts, and co commissioned the RTS award winning Big Nasty Show. Um, Alex Hoffman is head of video for Vice UK. Um, Alex is responsible for overseeing the production and programming strategy for, Vi for Vice's digital documentary output. Prior to that, he was global executive producer and head of music for Vice UK, managing Vice's music channel. And I think today, Alex is going to talk primarily about the hugely successful music channel, Noisy. Um, Alex has been responsible for a number of documentaries, including Hip Hop in the Holy Land, hosted by Mike Skinner, and the forthcoming feature, The Redemption of the Devil. Mark Bell is commissioning editor of the acclaimed BBC Art Strand Arena. He's commissioned numerous landmark series, including The Face of Britain, The Story of Women and Art, as well as returning series such as Big Painting Challenge and Fatal Fortune. Uh, Mark's also been responsible for many award-winning single docs, including Paul Arego, Secrets and Stories, BAFTA-winning Basquiat, Rage to Riches, and Black Hollywood, They've Got to Have Us. Um, <coughs> Who have I left out? Sorry. <coughs> Katie. Katie Metcalf is video commissioner for Nowness, digital, a digital channel premiering the best in global arts and culture across arts and design, culture, fashion and beauty, music and food and travel. She's commissioned editorial series such as Define Beauty, Fashion Disciples, Define Gender, and Great Gardens. She's also commissioned branded content in short doc format for clients such as Mulberry and Farfetch. So, thank you all for coming today, um, and I'll start by asking um, one by one if you could just give me a, an idea of uh, how you define an arts programme on your channel, Shuminda. How do I define an arts programme on my channel? Mm -hmm. Not any arts documentary. An arts programme, what, what, makes, what, 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 oh what, makes, what makes an arts oh programme for you? I kind of... <laughs> um, Thanks for coming. It's amazing. We thought there were going to be three people here, so it's so incredible that you've bothered to come. It's really nice to see you. Um, so an arts programme, I personally don't define them like that because I think it's really broad what we can actually do because arts and culture just spans <coughs> so many of the most interesting bits of our lives. So I and I'm interested in making them feel just like brilliant, exciting programmes that don't feel sort of constrained in a box of arts. Not that there's nothing wrong with being in arts, but I think it can sometimes feel a bit off-putting if something is sort of called an arts programme. Um, and so for me, it really could be pretty much anything. Um, at its heart, it often has an artist at the centre of it, but I define that really broadly. It can be um, a grime person like Big Nasty, or it could be Grace and Perry, or it could be a filmmaker, or it could be a writer. It could be really anything. It could be it could be a fashion designer. It could be someone who makes trainers. It could, and it's all it's all for me really about making a program that's exciting and interesting to sort of most people. That doesn't feel like it's niche. That it just feels like a really exciting program. But the person <coughs> and the subject at the heart of it feel interesting to lots of people and that say something about the world we live in now. Thank you. And Alex, how would you define, obviously you have a slightly different brief because you're mainly working in music and, and with Noisy. Yeah, I did, I did do, now I'm across um, <coughs> all of our content. But yeah, we don't have like an arts desk or an arts department as such. Um, but we, co we cover arts, I guess, in that way. Uh, like, for example, recently we did a film called Ballet and Bullets, which was loosely about uh, a bunch of... Uh, young ladies in Brazil who uh, had a ballet group, but it was sort of in the favelas, and it was, it was basically arts as a way, sort of a lens to look at a wider issue, which is t tends to be how we, how we work. We don't sort of do like sort of profiles about specific artists. We tend to just make broader documentaries, but it might be, as in that case, that ballet was sort of loosely the sort of backdrop to it. 
Um, but in terms of how we make music docs, which is mainly, I guess, what I'm here to talk about, it's the same as how we make any of our docs, really, which is, as I said before, it's like hoping to get people to think about broader issues beyond music and using music as the way to get into something and that might be end up actually be broadly broadly about mental health or criminality or family or friendship or, or whatever else it may be. But as with all our docs, I guess we're looking for something challenging, immersive and, and unusual. Great. And um, Mark, how would you define an arts programme on the BBC? Um, well, I think because we've got a number of platforms on which we put arts programmes, um, they sort of, it varies according to that to some extent. Um, on BBC One, we're looking for a, a broad audience, so, you know, programmes like Fake or Fortune or the Celebrity Painting Challenge will uh, hope to go to a, a mainstream audience that wouldn't necessarily tune into an arts programme. On BBC Two, we're looking for, um, you know, a combination of big reputational pieces that read, you know, like arts programmes unashamedly uh, that we'll stand up and fly the flag for, but also looking for uh, films we can play midweek that uh, that will cut through and uh, due to the strength of their narrative um, you know appeal to an audience beyond uh, somebody who will define themselves as an arts arts um, arts program viewer um, and then on BBC four it's much more sort of it's wide-ranging and uh, exploring specialisms and we'll make programs about arts but we'll also make programs with artists we'll make programs that look at arts and culture from an artistic point of view, so creative documentaries generally, what I would, I would describe as an arts programme. So I think that it's, it's rich and varied, as I said. Um, and at Nowness, I'd just say it's all arts. <laughs> um, I guess our, our kind of dream scenario is to bring together an artist and a filmmaker who cr together create a completely new piece of art. Say if you bring a dancer together um, with, with a director, and they create a completely new piece of art. Um, but to break it down a bit for how we work, uh, we commission, there's kind of three different strands we commission in, and one is what we call films about creativity. So that's films about an architect or a dancer um, or an artist. And then, then we have what we call creative films, and that's very director-led, and that's where we give a director a brief and then invite them to kind of go crazy with that and um, really develop their vision. So I guess what the third one's branded content, but I guess we can get to that later. Um, but there's more format-based documentaries about creativity and then pieces of creative art in themselves. Thank you very much. Um, I think um, probably what a lot of people in this room would like to know is kind of what you are all looking for as commissioners and what kind of ticks the box for you um, to make an interesting art commission. <laughs> so I'll just start with you, actually, Katie. Just mm -hmm. how, what kind of, um, what, what do people bring to you and what, what, what are you looking for? So what we're be. looking mostly to be surprised, we're looking for the unexpected and we're looking for directors with bold vision um, and we want to help them uh, develop that vision. Um, so we're always on the lookout for just work that excites us that we can take to the next level. Um, do, you, do you want me to go specifically into how we commission? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think probably a lot of people in this room are producers who are mm. wanting to know what, 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 what would, uh, you know, what, so what, what your really looking for? Yeah, so some, I guess whenever I meet directors, I meet a lot of directors and a lot of producers and I'm always trying to dig into what their interest is and what's their kind of niche um, unexpected interest. Because the way we commission is we'll often have a theme. So we'll start thinking about directors who have a style that we're interested in or an approach that we're interested in who can um, add something to the conversation on that theme. Um, so it's often, it kind of, it's sort of, when we commission, it's as, as projects come, really. Um, there, there are certain series that we're commissioning all the time, but the ones that have the most scope for creativity tend to be those ones that um, are about. Say, for example, we recently did a program on now, and it's, it's just running right now, called Survival Season, and it's all about the environment. So immediately, we're all thinking about which directors we know who are specifically interested in the environment and have something they want to say about that. And is it important that if people are bringing you ideas, they have to fit into one of your existing strands? Yes, yeah, sometimes, <coughs> sometimes directors will send us a treatment or talk to us about an idea that's been bubbling in their mind for a while and it will happen to fit with something, with a, with a kind of strand that we're working on. Um, and then that's amazing, we can commission them to make that film. But it's about, for us, find, yeah, finding those ideas that are bubbling away underneath. And Mark, well, are, you, are, you, are you looking for, you know, if someone comes to you with a, uh, a, an idea for a single about an obscure painter that no one's ever heard of, would you consider that? 
depends on the painter, it depends on the story behind it, it depends on uh, why, it depends on the access, it depends on whether or not there's an amazing reason to do it. I mean, you know, if, if it's, you know, if it's just, I've got a brilliant, you know, artist I want to make a film about, I would interrogate that a bit to find out before, <laughs> you know, before saying, yes, please. So, yeah, I mean, there were the obvious and layers of narrative that you'd be looking for. What, what are the things exciting you in terms of idea that come that are pitched to you? I mean, it's very exciting when somebody comes with access to something or someone that is, you know, unusual, you know, surprising, unusual. Somebody who's kind of hard to pin, been hard to pin down, or a area of culture that sort of doesn't feel like it's been adequately explored. Um, I really love films that go at a subject that you think you know in a way that you'd never thought of before. So that sometimes is due to unusual access. Um, you know, might be making a film about a writer and the family of that writer may never have spoken and suddenly they say they're up to tell a story in a different way, for instance. That kind of thing is interesting to me. So, yeah, I'm, in terms of singles, I'm, you know, open to all sorts of uh, levels of celebrity. It doesn't can have to be a famous name. Can you speak a little bit about the strand you commissioned into as well? Yeah, um, so Arena has been going for 45 years. It's um, a creative documentary strand. It's sort of pretty much invented arts documentary. Um, it's been running for a long time and in, has made hundreds and hundreds of uh, hours of programming, including very well-known films like the Bob Dylan film through to highly regarded innovative films that Nigel Silk Finch made in the 80s about Louise Bourgeois, about Elvis Presley, James Marsh started his career there. You know, some sort of a really rich heritage and, and running that strand is a kind of uh, a privilege and, uh, you know, and slightly terrifying and you want to make sure that the films that we commission that for now, hit a sort of a bar of um, originality and uh, surprise that feels like it um, does justice to the, the strand name. So we're announcing a, a, number, of, um, a number of films tomorrow. Uh, I can mention a couple of them now. Um, we've got a film about Seamus Heaney, um, which is going out this autumn, and it's beautifully here uh, in front of me, uh, which is a wonderful film with amazing access to uh, Seamus's family, including his brothers who rarely speak, talking about the very kind of um, local and domestic inspiration for much of his work, as well as his wider purchase on the culture. Um, got a film, um, you know, we've got three or four films. We did launch the Werner Herzog film uh, a couple of days ago here, which is again an arena for BBC Two. Um, we've got um, a couple of other films on BBC Two, and then on BBC Four we've got a, a film about... Uh, maverick musician called Ike White who um, who recorded an album in the 70s in prison in California and then got out of prison and you know what happened next is really what the film's about um, and it's a remarkable story it's been uh, Dan Byrne and the filmmaker has been making it for some years now and it's uh, it's an amazing thing so it's a range okay thank you um, Alex what, what are you looking for on the noisy um, well um, you know I don't want to be cliche about it but I guess you know I we're, we're looking for that thing that we hope sometimes people have when they watch our films where they think how, how did they how do they find that how do they always find these um, <coughs> mad stories and unusual characters and how do they manage to make it in a <coughs> in a surprising way um, but I think sometimes with us people they do get a bit confused or they have certain images of what we're into and I always just think people should try us you know they might be surprised and terms of what we do go for. We are, I guess, a little different than some places that we were mainly based around an in-house production team. So we're not commissioning out do the whole time, but we, we, we do. Do you feel um, <coughs> able to take risks on Noisy? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you know, probably the main reason why I went to Vice. And, you know, the freedom, the creative freedom there is really amazing. Um, and especially in the music world, because I always was into Vice, but they d weren't doing loads with music documentary when I started, so I did feel very free to sort of experiment with it and hopefully we've managed to build up something that's uh, a place that people expect to see challenging music docs. In. Great, and Shaminda, what about for arts on Channel 4? I suppose um, there's a different dynamic because you're um, presumably more ratings-led and you have to think about ratings. Yeah, we do, and actually, for me, the sweet spot is really clear. It's combining all of our sort of Channel 4 mischief-making desire to be sort of challenging and provocative 
with something that people actually want to watch and that will reach a broad audience. And I'll talk about 100 Vaginas later. But that's the ideal place because actually what I want more than anything is for people to watch our programmes and to talk about them and for there to be a reaction, to make news, to sort of cut through. There's so much noise. There's just so much to watch now that I'm desperate to commission things that will sort of cut through all that noise and what people will actually watch and sort of talk about and kind of share with each other. And that I want to see people writing about it in the papers and I want to see people tweeting about it and sharing it and everything. That is my biggest fear is being completely overlooked and ignored and I want to make impact. If you can't come to me with an idea that is both of those things together, then it's got to be quite clearly one or the other. Either it's going to be like huge and it's going to, everyone's going to watch it, it's going to be a massive smash, or it's going to be so out there, weird, sort of different and mischievous and provocative and challenging and everything that Channel 4 should be. So it's got to be at least either one of those two. What, what I can't have is sort of anything sort of middle of the road and in the middle, mulchy sort of mainstream mulch in the middle. And I think I, and above all, I want to sort of fall in love with the idea. Like I want to hear something I haven't heard before. So I just literally think I, ca I, like, I can't not do this. I'm gonna go and fight like a suffragette to get this commission for my bosses. And I think partly sort of continuing the metaphor of love that actually just came into my mind when someone else was saying anything. I, I come from a news background, which was like everything was sort of like you would get passionately involved in something and sort of an expert on something really obscure in one day, like, I don't know, some obscure sort of, I don't know, environmental issue or something. And then you'd forget about it the next day. And it was always like an endless series of sort of unsatisfying one night stands. But in this job, you have to live with this thing for ages. You have to sort of sweat and sort of cherish it and love it and keep talking about it till you're sort of almost bored of it. But you still have to sort of find the love like a child for this thing. Well, actually not a child because I was trying to be more romantic than that. But, <laughs> but so you, you really, I feel like I really have to love it. So if I feel a bit sort of half-hearted about it, then I know I'm not going to kind of be able to live with it. And, and that's why I sort of never want anyone to kind of be disappointed because I've got such a high... So if I sort of say, sorry, it's just not for me or I don't think it's for us, it's not, that's not bad. It just means that I feel like I can't live with it for the months and months and sometimes years not that it takes the to make... Of your well, it, it's just, it's just you emotions. need to feel passionate about it, don't you? You need to love it and you want to sort of see it actually happen. And it can be so painful, as we all know, doing this, that I think it's sort of so... I have a really sort of high bar and ambition for it. And my other dream, of course, is to have sort of the world's biggest stars on. So if someone sort of... <coughs> You know, if Beyonce could come on Channel 4 or, um, you know, I talked before about Donald Glover last time about how obsessed I am by Childish Gambino, This Is America, and I still kind of adore it, even though it's so old now. You know, just these people who everyone loves and adores, you know, if, if you have any access like that, I'm the one on this panel. No. And when, does someone become <laughs> so, um, when, when does someone become so big that they're not really, it's not really an arts doc anymore and it's a bit cheating because you're commissioning an arts doc? So you're no, I said at the right so at the beginning, big. there's no boundaries for me. Okay. I said that right at the start. I'm open to anything, so. Okay, good. Um, and I think we're going to show some clips now. Um, if we have a, the first clip is um, from um, a recent commission. These are recent commissions that um, our guests have asked to show, to share with us today. And the first one is um, from Noisy, and it's um, a program called Jesus Loves Goths. Yeah. So, Alex, what's, what's the story of that commission? Oh, God knows. Um, yeah, so there were the, it, the question was like, oh, bring something new that you're really excited about, as if we think it will be a big success. I've, I'll be honest, I have no idea whether this will be successful but I am uh, excited about it in in my own way this was a commission that came like a few things advice it's a, a written editorial piece which is a really useful way for us to get stuff quite often there'll be a really amazing vice written article and then someone else will run off and make a video about it so we try and get in there first um, this popped up and we especially within like heavy music we haven't really done much for quite a while um, so the guy who you saw interviewing, he's a writer, freelance writer for us. He wrote it about, I think he was just, he's really into heavy music, and he was at a show and saw someone was giving out flyers for a, a Bible study group for people into rock and, you know, metal, goth, and punk. Uh, and he was just kind of intrigued, went along, started writing this piece, and he got really into it. So I think it was his passion for it that he en he's ended up being quite close with some of these people. 
and he, he's in a band himself, and he actually, um, one of his band members passed away, and he posted this on, on Facebook, and he ended up getting a lot of support from the people who were in the group, and he's not religious at all himself, but he ended up, he, he goes quite a lot to the, to the meetups just because, I don't know, he seems to get some sort of solace from it. And uh, he was just really passionate the way he pitched it, and you know, we're not sure exactly how long it's gonna be. Um, that was going to be my next question, actually. I mean, do you have a kind of ideal length, or does it vary? For We're trying to be a bit more organised about it, but that was kind of the best thing because I came from TV. When I went to Vice, like the first piece I made, I remember them me saying like, "How how long is it?" Because I was used to not working to the minute or the second, but the frame, <laughs> and they were just like, "I don't know, is it good?" Like it was completely up to me, uh, you know, or the team how long it should be. Um, and we try to be the same, just try to sort of make it and see what it feels feels like, whether this feels like something we should go back and revisit them over a year and all of that. But I think this probably will be a, a short. It'll probably be somewhere between five and ten minutes. Um, but I like just doing stuff from time to time that people don't expect, especially musically. We've sort of, um, we've made a lot in a sort of rap sphere, and that's, you know, our, our viewers are really into that. Um, but it's good to just uh, do something really random every once in a while. Excellent. Um, Mark, I think we've got a clip. Would you like to tell us a bit about your clip, please? Yeah, you asked me to find something that uh, you found when you did it was uh, felt risky or uh, sort of innovative. And so I picked this clip by a piece you made that went out at the end of last year. It was an artist, Rachel McLean, who's a video artist and performance artist. And um, the reason it felt ris risky... Sorry, Mark, sorry to interrupt you. I think we're on the recent commission clip first. Oh, right, the so new one. Mistake. Sorry, yeah. uh, wrong one, sorry. Okay, so this one is a, a film, Ben Anthony uh, is directing it. It's about Keith Haring. Um, it's a lovely piece, uh, I think. It promises to be good, and uh, it's just mostly archived, but you'll see, get the vibe for it just from the, the opening sequence. So uh, what's special about that is that he's going to, um, we, we're trying to make it almost entirely using archive and a lot of that will be unseen home movie archive and uh, it'll hopefully have a really, really rich feeling of that time and that amazing period of when the Lower East Side was really doing something extraordinary. And what, what was the reason for commissioning that film? It was because there's a, there was a show coming up, but I don't think we're going to quite, it's not going to be ready for the beginning of the show, but that's okay. Uh, you know, Keith Haring's a really, uh, now it's a really interesting time to be looking at the legacy of that period when a whole generation of extraordinary creative talents were uh, decimated by AIDS. Uh, their, you know, their surviving friends and, um, and relatives and uh, co uh Conspirators were, um, you know, at a time when it's a good it's a good time to reflect. It feels far enough away, but also still within touching distance. And I think you can get, you know, I think that period is really interesting now. I think people are living in a shadow of some, you know, big uh, sense of doom. And uh, I think it speaks to us in all sorts of interesting ways. And what stage are you at in production? It's in the edit. Okay. Um, and. Um, I think for our next clip, we have um, a recent commission from Katie uh, now. Oh yeah. So it's actually quite rare to catch us at the point that we've got a film that's completed or nearly completed but hasn't been released yet because we move quite fast. Um, and like we've commissioned 70 films or so a year. So yeah, it's quite a fast play pace. Um, but this was actually quite a one-off. It kind of came up out of nowhere. Jefferson Hack, who's um, our creative director, had a meeting with a guy called John Gray, who's the founder of a culinary collective in the Bronx, New York, um, uh, called Ghetto Gastro. And basically, to cut a long story short, he was in prison and he was offered release on the basis that he um, do something for the community. So he set up this culinary co collective and he had a history of um, selling crack on the streets. And he, in all his work, he's <coughs> always created a parallel between cooking crack cocaine and um, cooking for the community. And like there's this, so we were like, okay, how do we make a documentary about this guy? He's um, creating, having glassware collection created in Venice, like made by these incredible artisan uh, graphs, like glass blowers. Um, and how do we sort of create a story that can capture the essence um, in a documentary format? Um, so this isn't quite finished. The reason being that um, he's got Solange on board to do some music, which is awesome. Um, so we just wait, it's with her, so hopefully that will happen. So at the moment, it's still temporary music, still work in progress. So 
the directors, um, Alicia Smith Leverock, um, and I guess her, her main goal with this was to create that juxtaposition between the sort of unorthodox and the traditional. And um, when that gets released, how does that iterate? Does that come out as part of a season, or is it? So this is actually this is going to be a standalone, but we're always trying to find sort of moments to link to. So originally, this was going to come out. I think it was like last month during either Salone or during um, New York Design Week. Um, but because we had to hold off, we'll probably now do some kind of event in the Bronx to support the release because um, the Ghetto, Ghetto Gastro have their own space there. But yeah, it's about making that connection from the digital, like online to the real world just to, um, one thing i th think might be quite interesting um and different to um how you work is that because you're essentially enabling artists to create the vision do you are you quite hands off with them it varies um with this type of film it, it, i tend to sort of talk to the directors and give them steer but ultimately leave give them space um to make the film they want to make because that's what we, we are in a unique and privileged position of being able to uh, give that level of creative freedom. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and Shaminda, what's, what's your recent commission that you're excited about? I'm still really excited about it because I haven't seen much of it yet. She said, looking at the producer, Michael Hewitt, who's sitting in the front row. So I'm still in love with it, but who knows what will happen when I see more of it. Um, so this is really, I am actually really excited about it at the moment. And this is a sneak preview, so we can't tweet about it yet, even though I'm sure you're all longing to sort of tell the world you've seen this clip. It hasn't been announced yet. Um, I'm excited about it because it's a return to Channel 4 of Mark Cousins, the filmmaker, who did his amazing story of film, which was on Raw 4. Um, and I'm really excited about it because it's about the Troubles. And I've been lucky enough to spend a bit more time in Belfast lately. Um, and I've become increasingly obsessed by what the Troubles mean. And I just can't quite believe we are not thinking about it more. Because when we think about... Brexit, I know everyone keeps talking about the backstop and the border and all of that, but I think there's something much deeper about it that is really, I'm thinking about all the time, which is the fact that we're at such a huge change in the life of our country, and we're all thinking about kind of democracy and what it means, and what it means when democracy and sort of countries fall apart. And actually, what was so powerful about looking at some of the story of the Troubles was that it's really the last time in our country we've seen kind of this level of sectarian violence and disorder. We didn't really live through the war, mm. the Second World War in Britain, in a day-to-day -day life beyond the Blitz. I know about the Blitz. And so I think there's a really extraordinary sort of lesson from history about thinking about the Troubles. And in August, it's going to be um, 50 years since British troops rolled into Northern Ireland, um, which was in 1969. And so this film is about um, Mark Cousins, who lived through the Troubles, he grew up there, um, talking about his personal memories of living through the Troubles, but more excitingly than that even, is that he's telling us the story of the Troubles as seen in films. And it's hopefully, Michael, going to have all his sort of brilliant um, artistry of sort of stitching together all of those film clips and exploring the way that story has been told, and sort of that'll uncover itself lots of different layers. So this is really rough, but it will give you a little flavor of it. So we missed a bit of sort of what happened just before that, where Mark Cousins was explaining that um, when you were children, you, you, you might hear a knock at the door and be sort of terrified about who that could be, who's the sort of stranger at the door, and children would sort of press their face up against the sort of glass in the door, and that's what he's brilliantly reflecting on there. Um, so to me, it's an incredibly sort of timely mix of the film and the culture and the sort of social fabric of the time told in a really personal way, and I think it'll, we'll all learn something from it, hopefully. And is that a film about an artist? It's not directed by Mark? It's not directed by Mark. Um, but he is well, authoring it. He's a filmmaker, <coughs> so as I said, in the widest possible sense, interpreting arts and culture, but he's authoring it. Um, and the director is Brian Henry Martin, um, and the production company is Doubleband. If you want to talk more about it, you can go up to Michael, <laughs> who's just sitting right there. Um, it's still in the edit, and it will be on Channel 4 in August. 
And does a film like that surprise you when you see it unfolding in the edit? Because it must be quite hard to imagine what that film is before it's made. I completely imagine it. Like, I completely have an imagining of it, <laughs> which is probably not going to be anything like what it is. Um, and I haven't been... I'm going to go and see the whole thing um, in a few weeks. Um, so I've just seen those clips. But obviously, I've endlessly had endless conversations about it. Um, and I'm, and it's like what I think. You just hope that you'll be sort of pleasantly surprised when you see it, when you see it. But obviously, we've talked about it a lot, and um, I'm really excited. Yeah, about it looks it. very exciting. Um, so I'd just like to kind of ask each of you now to tell us a bit about how people like me and probably most of the people in this room come to you with ideas. Um, you've all talked a little bit about what you're looking for, um, but how, how, and where and why, what do mean? Do we pitch things to you, Shaminda? Um, so you can email me. My um, email address is on our website, snahal at channel4.co.uk, and you can just write a sentence or a paragraph or send a treatment um, or, you know, just it can be something really quick. Um, and uh, you can sort of come and have a chat um, if... If I think, does this sound bad? If I think the idea sounds interesting, I might say, let's talk about it a bit more. Um, sometimes the ideas sort of change in the conversation. Um, I always say to people that I really love any other kind of gift, like short bread someone bought me once, which okay, was that's, made that's the meeting. Really I know I was in the I didn't know that about you. Now, now I know so why you never <laughs> commission any of my ideas. I'm bringing biscuits next time. No, exactly. <laughs> it's really simple, but it does sort of make it a bit more fun. Good. And would you just talk a little bit about um, Random Acts as well? Yes, that's Random whole... Acts. Is Catherine Bray here? Catherine Bray is my lovely colleague who commissions Random Acts. Yeah. But for those who don't know, Random Acts... So is Random, Act, Random Acts is um, really exciting. It actually covers a bit of the same sort of territory that um, Casey's <sighs> work does on Nowness. It's our sort of pure art film strand. It's been going since 2011. It's a really exciting strand. It's now a digital-only strand. You can see it on... Facebook, YouTube, all four, Instagram, Twitter. Um, so it's 50 films a year. They're usually about kind of anything between three and seven or eight minutes. Um, and they're very much, the emphasis on ma is making them be sort of artist-led, experimental. Uh, we're looking for sort of the wildest ideas. And again, on our website, there are details for Random Acts. And we've had some really amazing people um, doing Random Acts for us. One of them is... Jen Nakiru, who's got a film showing here um, about techno, um, who also worked on the Beyonce Jay-Z mm. apeshit video and made a random act about voguing. Um, so we've got, to, I mean, there are just some really exciting directors and filmmakers who are making random acts. Um, and if so, if you want to do that kind of thing and not worry about what I was saying before, which is trying to get millions of people watching them, you know, those are the, that's the place for that really experimental, sort of cutting edge work. And, and as you said, they're short form. Are they also small budgets? What so the budget for that is sort of anything between about three and five thousand pounds. But some of them, we do work, uh, we do partner up with other agencies for some of them. It could be the BFI or, or one of the sort of regional screen bodies. And so sometimes the budget can be um, sort of beefed up a bit more. And actually, across the board, we. All of us, I think, are sort of looking much more to co-productions and other avenues to sort of try and get more money and to sort of either make a, a piece feel bigger and better or just to sort of help get something away that we desperately want to do. Okay. And uh, Alex, with you, how, how does it work? Because obviously most of your um, pieces are made in-house, is that correct? Um, a lot of it is, yeah. I mean, uh, worth pointing out, we don't do any sort of bribery, whether it's shortbread or <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> I'm quite quite disgusted with what, what I've heard oh, today. I mean, <laughs> yeah. um, yes, it is mainly in-house, but there's lots of sort of um, things in between in-house and external. So it's very rare we'll just sort of give some money to an external production company and they just deliver a final product. But there's lots of independent filmmakers or people that have got a thing that's going somewhere and we might help them. We might sort of help with a mix and grade or sort of finishing it off. So... Um, I know it sounds very vague, but the best is to just try, you know, just, just Send e email, email me. Just, but I guess, like, not, we're not really looking for just, like, f profiles um, and just something quite specific. And obviously, when there's access, that helps. I mean, I guess the same things that most people are looking for. But I do get a lot of very broad things, you know, just like, why don't you make a documentary about rap or something, which is, like, it's great. And there's some amazing sure no rap one's ever said that to you. They have. 
Um, no. But um, yeah, so something sort of quite specific and preferably something that w I guess something that we couldn't we couldn't get. We and couldn't get what, what level of funding is available for people that bring things to you? It might just be they're looking for a bit of completion funding or? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's also case by case because I say it is mainly in-house, but it just depends on how good it is. If something's great, we'll, we'll find the way of making it. But a lot of the time, because of the way we work, it is more what else we can provide, which is obviously having kit and editors and, um, you know, all the technical stuff, but also, uh, you know, network, you know, eyeballs. And Mark, for you in the BBC, um, what I guess one thing that is quite interesting for us all to know is how important the numbers are, because, you know, do you have a kind of carte blanche to make films that ennoble uh, the nation and uh, make people feel lofty and smart, or well, do you just care about ratings? Both. Um, I do think we're here to uh, do that. I think we're here to make uh, films that feel like they're going to last, that people will still be talking about, that feel like they're important, that add to the culture in some way and that you know uh, partly because it's it's hard for other people to make those films so I do think we have a commitment to to do that um, but I sit as part of a, a commissioning team which includes me uh, where I look after a lot of the singles particularly the sort of orthodox um, Emma Cusack who uh, uh, looks after a lot of the midweek series on BBC two and lots of the series on BBC four um, Lamia Debussy, who is the sort of genre editor and also uh, looks after a lot of the topical, uh, including some of the film coverage and uh, some of the partnerships with the sector. And then Stephen James Yeoman, who looks after a lot of the digital and online. And uh, that includes, uh, we've got uh, BBC Introducing Arts, which is a partnership with the Arts Councils, including the Nation's Arts Councils. And so it's about 250 uh, short films over the next couple of years. I think the, the last round of that is now closed, but uh, we do have a commitment to look for short form. So, for instance, we often do these in seasons. Um, we did an animation season on BBC Four a couple of months ago where I looked after a single film, which was a history of British animation. It was, a, it was focused on British animation, um, which was made out of Bristol Indie. And then we also commissioned young animators to make shorts, which we bundled up. We put online, but also bundled up as a single on BBC Four, so to make an animation night. So we'll often create sort of nights, moments, weekends, seasons around subjects like that, which will include short form, long form, traditional doc, presenter led, and possibly a sort of performance piece. Or a, you know, we 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 do a number of um, performance captures. Uh, we did that uh, believers are not brothers, Javad Ali poor thing. You know, so we'll we'll do some both quite sort of out there stuff as well as some more uh, mainstream performance, d dance performance capture, young dance of the year. So there's a huge amount of material, you know, we do a huge amount of output and it does an awful lot of different things. So it's really hard for me to answer it in one sentence. Thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> and Katie, what about, um, how do people bring ideas to you? And, and um, is it something that you lead by approaching people or do you, are you quite open to people approaching you? We do actually have quite a quite an ideal journey that we like to um, go on with filmmakers, which is first to premiere their film on Nowness, and then to commission them to make an, like for an editorial commission, uh, and then to work with them on a branded, a piece of branded content. So that's the kind of the journey and the budget getting bigger each time. And in terms of our budgets, it's very similar. It's sort of between five and seven uh, grand per episode. It's usually like a three to five minute film. Um, but it, it, often, like, I have directors emailing me all the time ideas, and my advice would be to always, because so I often get an email that will just be, like, the top-line idea and then a link to my website, this is my work, and it's, like, so vague. <laughs> and um, it's much better if, if you send um, a, the top-line idea but then some very clear visual references. So specific, it could be stills or it could be videos of the director's work you admire that you want to make your film in the style of or you're inspired by. And then just one or two links to your previous work that are relevant. Um, so it just makes it a lot easier to make an assessment. And then there are uh, three of us commissioners and we also have an editorial director called Bunny who came from ID Vice and uh, about a year and a half ago. And so any idea has to go through all of us in our development meeting and it gets discussed and it needs to be signed off by Bunny. So that's kind of our process of working towards mm. that. And um, in terms of uh, um, Mark and Shminda have to get numbers
is another way if you're in trouble. What about you? What about you? And I'll ask that to Alex as well. How do you judge your audiences? How do you actually count how many people are watching? So how do we? Yeah. How do you how do you know what the views are? Um, we have a report that is circulated every week that's tracking the views and where they're coming from and whether films are being picked up by publications and getting the extra boost that way. Um, but the, the, f the metric that we really care about is engagement. So it's whether audiences are liking, sharing, commenting on social media, like that's really important to us. Nice. Um, more important than getting uh, a lot of views actually, because it's, it's, it means that somebody's watching that film and wanting to share it. And so that's, that's the key. Yeah, and I'll just ask you that as well, Alex. How, how do you judge? I mean, we, we can all see the ratings for BBC and Channel 4, but how, how, how are you judging your success? Well, I'd, I'd agree with that, obviously, engagement. And subscribing is, is big, as in the people not just saw one film they like, but they're interested in getting regular updates. I mean, uh, obviously, our stuff is mainly YouTube, uh, Facebook, all of those places where the views are written there. So it's certainly no, no big secret. And I think... Um, you know, people may think to the contrary, but all of our filmmakers, they, they want impact with their films, they want people to see it, and everybody wants just lots, lots of views. I don't think it's a, you know, a difficult sort of balancing act, you know, when we talk about whether stuff's for sort of, um, you know, artistic purposes or for, or for views. If, you, if you've done a good job, lots of people will watch it, I think. Great. Um, okay, so we're going to show some more clips now, and this is, um, we've asked each of our guests to give us an example of um, a risk-taking commission, um, which, um, Shaminda, would you like to introduce your clip? Yes, I would like to say that I would like to be taking risks all the time. I would like everything to be risky, because at Channel 4 we are, of course, born risky, and being challenging and provocative is sort of what we are, one of the things that we're set up to do, to challenge people. Um, so really, it should all be risky, but I have to say this was did feel a bit risky. Not risky in a sort of really dangerous way, but just because a lot of the conversations we had about it, we had to sort of challenge ourselves and on what we really thought about it. So this is the film 100 Vaginas, which I'm incredibly proud to have had on the channel. And the director, Jenny Ash, is over there in the denim with the boots, mm -hmm. and the executive producer, Suzanne Curran, is there waving. Um, so they would be much more interesting to talk to about it. But basically, this was an exploration of... Now, I... It's called vaginas, but there was a big debate about how really they're vulvas that we're showing. But I just couldn't bear to sort of have a hundred vulvas because I just thought it sounded really bouncy. So um, it's all about how we don't really, like lots of women don't even look at their own vagina or know what it looks like or sort of want to know. And um, so this was a really, I guess the big debate we had about it was sort of how much to show, what to sort of what, co what kind of conversation to have about it. And in the end, I think we reached a place where we felt it was quite sort of funny, heartbreaking, and surprising and different, and it opened up a real conversation. And I'm incredibly proud that it is one of our biggest 10 o'clock documentaries we've had on Channel 4 since March 2018. So here's a clip. I think this is the beginning, actually. Still on all four if you haven't watched it yet. <laughs> and how, how, what, what was the reaction apart from numbers? What, what, what is is um, the critical reaction important to you? For, for yeah, it's all important. I just want all the reaction, all the numbers, all the critical acclaim and Everything. all the awards. That's basically <laughs> it. Um, so, yeah, it had huge numbers. It had massive critical acclaim. It got sort of five-star reviews in every paper. And it had, I mean, Jenny will probably remember, it had sort of incredibly grandiose things written about it. Um, uh, people felt that it had a sort of a really unique visual style, that it opened up a real conversation, and that it showed women talking in a really sort of honest way about their bodies. And that f that's a really interesting, current, much bigger conversation we're having in Britain. And it felt like we sort of tapped into that. And uh, lots of people were sort of talking about showing it in schools to open a dialogue about it. Um, so... Yeah, I think it really did. Um, in fact, there was some brilliant quote, which I meant to look up and I didn't have time, but there were, there were lots of people saying that it was one of the sort of cultural conversations of the year and it's still in the kind of best programmes of 2019. Anyway, so I do love all that, yeah. Good, and what about your... Um, do, you, do you get nervous when you've got a film that you think is a bit riskier than... No, you know? I get excited and I want it to be as risky as possible because, like I said, I want everyone to be talking about it. So I'm actually really excited when I think it's going to be sort of complained about or make people nervous. Great, okay. And um, I think, Mark, we've got a 
clip from you next if you'd like to yeah, talk about that. Yeah, we've talked about it because I got it all wrong. Sorry about that. So this is just Rachel McLean, who's a performance artist. The reason it was risky was because it was using bits of some of the most iconic BBC, you know, uh, one of the most famous BBC arts voiceovers that we've done, Kenneth Clark's Civilization. She was lip syncing it and to make a different point about what he was making. So it was slightly kind of tilting at a, a fairly kind of... Um, you know, a cornerstone of the BBC's cultural output, and it's quite a sort of wild uh, film that we put out last November. <laughs> so it was all shot on green screen in Glasgow. Um, so all the sound was found. Uh, so and it's it's not just it didn't just use sound from Civilization, but she did just talk that way. But it was also a sort of commentary on. Uh, kind of the male view of art history and uh, feminism generally and it was very much her vision. And did you feel that you might have made a, um, a difficult choice in commissioning that? Do you worry about those kind of decisions? Well, while I was commissioning it, I was also involved in uh, doing another version of Civilization, doing Civilizations, which was a, a multi-part landmark arts program involving sort of big thinkers talking about the global history of art. So to be doing two in concert was a strange experience. So yeah, I know it felt kind of, it was good to be doing a mixture of things and to be sort of looking at the counter veiling sort of a, you know, a different argument at the same time as you were presenting a big sort of sweeping argument too. And how did it do ratings wise? It was uh, not surprisingly relatively modest, but I was very pleased with it. A lot of pick up, a lot of pick of the day. Mm -hmm. We uh, showed it at the National Gallery, um, which was an amazing experience, and it was a full house there, and um, you know, a couple of hundred thousand on BBC Four, then on iPlayer, so it did pretty well on iPlayer. People talked about it. I mean, it was it was art. It was definitely an art artist film, and um, for an artist film, it did really well. You know, that those kind of films play in galleries normally, uh, and it was a sort of cranked up version of one of those, and so I think for it to get what it got was a, was was great. I was happy with what it did. Yeah, and I guess that's kind of one of the reasons the BBC, BBC's there. For yeah, that's what we, you know, we, we need to do that, and we need to do big sweeping art narratives, and we need to do other stuff too. So, yeah, no, uh, we need the range. And, you know, we'd like to take risks also, but we need to do other stuff also as well. Katie, what's, what's your clip that um, you would consider a risk-taking commission? Yeah, so firstly, I'd just say I'd echo Shamindo in saying that all the films we commission should be risk-taking. You know, they should all... They should all be about putting ourselves in an uncomfortable place and doing something new. Um, but this particular film, I just wanted to show it because it, um, it's a very simple concept, but it had a very powerful effect. Um, and it's actually one of our most successful um, films ever on Nowness. It's had over 28 million views on YouTube. Um, and it's a short film that's commissioned for our Define Beauty series. And Define Beauty is all about um, where, the be where beauty meets the grotesque. It's like skating the line between attraction and repulsion. And the idea is it's not necessarily about telling a story like a full narrative. It's about getting you from A to B, but making the audience feel something. I think that's what this film does really successfully, and that's why um, it's done so well. And it's by a queer photographer called uh, Matt uh, Lambert. Um, I think it did so well because it makes you, even makes you feel kind of uh, or or it makes you feel turned on or it just it just evokes a reaction. Um, yeah. And what was what was the story of that commission? How did that how did that come about? Um, so with Define Beauty, what we do is identify topics. So we'll say like bum implants, um, like we've on sweat, nipples, waxing, um, and we were talking to Matt Lambert and we were talking about sweat and it just came up. We just started talking about a concept and, and just decided to keep it really, really simple. And there was some sort of back and forth about whether, you know, whether the audio was audible enough. Mm. Um, but then it actually kind of lends it a sort of almost CD quality that works really well. Um, but yeah, that was one of the, an example of a conversation that went on post the film being made. Yeah, when I was watching it, I was trying to work out if that was real sweat or if someone was just spraying kind of... I don't know. Obviously, I mean, if it was the BBC, real. you would have had to be real sweat. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you have artistic freedom. <laughs> um, Alex, what's, what's your risk-taking commission clip that you'd like to show us? Um, so this was something from a few years ago. Um, I guess, well, I don't risk, I guess we spent a long time making a music doc with sort of nobody famous in it. But aside from that, it was mainly because it was a, a quite controversial in, in a way. Um, 
we'd sort of spent quite a few years, or maybe our entire history, I guess, trying to build up a reputation and sort of respect amongst music fans. And so there was the concern that, that a lot of people might be like, why, why are these people? Why are you making a doc about these people? And in music world, especially in this world, but like I feel like just music generally, people who are really into music can be very serious about it, as I am, I guess. But when it comes to music docs, some people don't necessarily get or they feel that a music doc should be about the best music that there is, and then you make a doc about that. Whereas obviously I'm just really into just finding an unusual story. <laughs> and when I heard about this, it was just like, we have to do this. And it was about the, the grime scene in Blackpool. And it was, yeah, quite a few years ago, and it came from a, a, an editorial meeting where they were gonna write an article about it. And I was like, this sounds a bit too interesting. Let's go and check it out. So it took quite a long time to get it together, but I don't know, I mean, I guess you should just watch it, but the short version is that we knew at that stage that there were grime scenes around the country, that's not so unusual, but Blackpool was really specific um, for a bunch of ways, I guess we'll watch it, but um, it was also, the thing that I love sometimes is when there's something that's, um, especially with YouTube, where you can just see something is happening, and the views on these people's videos was really high compared to like, more than a lot of major labels signed people with big marketing pushes. And it just was all a bit too fascinating. So even though it was a bit, um, you know, we didn't know what was going to come of it, it was, it was too sort of interesting to not go up there and see what it was about. Okay, let's watch the clip. So yeah, it was, it was enormously how, how, successful. How did, the, how did the result of you know, what you ended up with, did that kind of match your vision and your kind of expectations and hopes? I mean, in terms of the um, impact it had, it was a lot more. I certainly didn't think it would do anything like it did. Um, but in terms of the end product of the film, yeah, I think I wanted it to have some heart in it. Like when it came to, especially because they're so young, like um, there was a lot of concern in, in the office. You wanted to make sure you, you care and all of those things. Um, but I think I've managed to persuade everyone by the end that they, these kids, I mean, they, you have to sort of, I guess we haven't even shown any music and you've got to kind of watch it, but they'd kind of become like memes and all they were getting really was abuse and they're really young. Um, so I had to sort of persuade everyone that like, actually this is the first thing that they've ever been involved in that is actually dealing with them as a human being, as a person and with a family and with feelings. Um, so even though we showed a lot of raw stuff, um, you know, the, the lyrics and everything are, are pretty raw, um, and their life is really chaotic. Um, but yeah, I'm, 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 really, I'm really glad we did it, and then we did a follow-up a year later to sort of see how they were getting on. Oh, I was going to ask you, actually, if they, um, if they were consulted before it went out, did they get to see Oh, you? yeah. Like, we're obviously, like most filmmakers, I guess you don't necessarily want people uh, mm. seeing it, but because they were so young, we were very involved. I'd say they were really super relaxed about it. Like they came down, like they'd never performed before, and they came down and there was a screening and, and they performed basically for the first time. But they had their families with them and we were so worried because they're saying really mean stuff about each other in the lyrics. But they're really calm about it. They, they just know that it's just entertainment and they actually get on fine. They just take the piss out of each other in their lyrics just because they, but they're entertainment, I guess. Great. Um, so we're going to have a Q&A shortly, so um, it'd be great if you all have some questions ready for the panel. Um, one thing I just want to ask you all, um, and I think it's particularly um, uh, relevant now when there are so many platforms opening up and so many new spaces for the arts, how do you commission in a way that reflects the reality of the world rather than the tastes and sensibilities of you as individuals? Um, I'll ask that to you first, Mark. You have to go, I mean, that's a, it's a hard, as a commissioner, it's a hard question to answer because in the end you have to follow your instincts. As Shemenda said earlier, you have to sort of believe in stuff in order to commission it because you know you're going to spend a lot of time with it. And so a lot of it is on gut instinct and you have to keep that gut instinct feeling broad and you think, hang on, I like this, would anybody else like it? So it is a weird combination. But, you know, you work with a team of commissioners, it gets, you know, ideas get tried out on other people before they get commissioned. The channel controller has to say yes. So there are certain sort of checks and balances that go on. Um, and we have a strategy. So, you know, we're looking to, um, you know, we're looking to innovate. We're looking to be a hothouse for talent. We're looking to, uh, you know, invest in quality and all those things. And so we have a, a series of things that we ask questions of every idea to say, 
is it going to hit any of those targets or all of those targets? And so, you know, there's, there's a way of, um, of safeguarding against a sort of subjective sort of, ooh, I like that one, I'll have it sort of response. Do you think, do you think it's particularly difficult in the arts, though, because, because it's so subjective and people will be so passionate about things that many of which might be deemed niche by, you know, those in a position to commission them? Um, yes, but I think when things are niche, sometimes they can be great. You know, specialism is no bad thing. I believe that you should, you know, celebrate the detail. You should, uh, you know, sometimes look to the margins to find sometimes the big stories. You may not necessarily, the, the artist you're interested in may not be a national name, but their story may be big enough to merit the attention. And um, Jaminda just was coming in, was talking about a film we put on BBC Two about Sean Scully, who's quite a big name in abstract painting, and he's an incredibly successful artist, but a lot of people in this country hasn't, haven't heard of him. And, um, you know, I think that's, it's good. We're here to sometimes celebrate names that should be bigger, better known than they are, or names that uh, aren't as well known as for all sorts of reasons. So I don't think it necessarily is a problem. It's a question of finding a story that will grab people. You know, it, you know, you know what it's about. You know. uh, um, Shaminda, how do you find that? Because you you commission not just arts films, and I guess uh, you know how how do you weigh up those decisions when it's uh, an artist that might be someone that is important, but you don't necessarily like them, for example. Does, are, you, are you able to work with, with with a film like that, or does it have to really tick your box? I think, I mean, look, I think all of the things that Mark said are true in the extent that we're not kind of lone renegades who are able to just sort of dole out loads of cash, which obviously would be great if we could, you know, we're, we're within a system. At Channel 4, you know, we have got Channel 4-y things, you know, we're, you know, think of those sort of phrases, you know, we're, we're trying to be different, we're trying to champion alternative points of view, all of those things are real, and we really feel those, that, you know, we haven't got so many channels, we haven't got all these different platforms we've got quite a small space in which to make impact so we are trying to be different to sort of offer things that you won't see elsewhere and my i sort of feel like it's it it's the thing i would want to drive home apart from big numbers and huge impact and all of that is really the topicality it's about what is it about this idea that kind of really says something about the world? So I talked a bit about the troubles. I talked about the kind of conversation we're having about women and bodies and all that kind of stuff. Um, the Akram Khan film, The Curry House Kid, was about his experience of racism that, again, feels unbelievably... He hadn't really spoken about much publicly before. feels like a real sort of conversation of our times, you know, in the divided Britain and all that kind of stuff. You know, Grace and Perry's sort of obsessions are with all the kind of identity fault lines of today. So um, the Lem Say film, nominated for a BAFTA, about kids in care, was about sort of the untold stories often of kids in care plus his own story so it's about that sort of relentless search for why does this matter now what is it saying about britain and the world that we're living in now which let's face it is unbelievably sort of interesting and i can't remember a time when sort of politics and the conversations we're all having are more sort of fascinating so that's really what i feel like a channel four idea has got to have the, the sort of sense of difference and topicality and a sort of real urgency about it um and so in the end, you don't have to worry too much about me. <laughs> just think more about the idea and does it have that kind of power and urgency. Okay. And Alex, what do you do, you, what do, you do to protect your uh, commissioning decisions from just being things that you're interested in? Well, like, I mean, I guess it's for other people to judge if they think I, I do that. Obviously, I, I hope I don't. But like I mentioned before, I guess there is that worry because I came into a bit of a vacuum where they decided to start this music channel and I had this music experience and no one else was really doing it. Um, but I'm very aware of the sort of brand reputation and, you know, all the films that have been made before me. Um, but I guess the, the main thing is just having a young, diverse staff. And like, I'm absolutely ancient for Vice. You know, there's probably like three people in the company older than me. So um, I think the staff definitely keep me on, on my toes. And, um, and also, like, you know, you get the feedback. The feedback can be, can be brutal. It's all very publicly out there, and, and we enjoy checking it out sometimes. Um, exactly. And Katie? Um, so I guess that the way we work is we'll set a theme and then we will cast out to like a diverse selection of um, directors and say, well, tell us your point of view. What do you have to say about this theme? And in that sense, we gather 
opinion and then create an editorial vision out of that or an editor uh, overarching editorial point of view out of that but right. it's done collectively and listening to the filmmaking community um but on the note about um about like working on stuff you don't like it's quite funny because when i joined nowness i had no tolerance for dance films and <laughs> zero interest at all and so immediately like our managing editor said well we're going to give all the dance films to the biggest critic in the room so i got all the dance films um now but now i love them, them. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Um, so, um, there's only a couple of minutes left, actually, for questions. If anyone has any, uh, there's a lady with a hand up there. Will you just wait for the microphone? Because it, I know it's a small room, but we need to record it. Hi, Shaminda. I'm Jo from Broadcast. Um, I know that... Um, for the di I didn't mean the thing about shortbread, by the way. That was just a joke. <laughs> That's the headline. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought, because um, the comedy sandpit is like it's seen an investment of, I think it's one million in short form comedy. You were talking about Random Acts. Has it actually seen a budget increase um, in that? And also, my second question, if I could just sneak in, is, is there anything that you've seen um, at the festival so far that you've been like, I really wish we'd commissioned that? So the comedy sandpit is separate to Random Acts, it's its own thing, and we've also announced, Danny Horan announced a partnership with Barkov for short form documentary, which I think was in broadcast the other week. So obviously all of this digital stuff and expansion of short form content is part of how we're all moving towards in the future and expanding and experimenting with digital stuff. So Random Acts continues, and um, we have four, 50 films this year and hope that it will continue, although we haven't sort of signed, sealed, and delivered that, but I'm hoping Random Acts will continue. Um, and then the other question about what I've seen, I only arrived today, but I've been using a bit of the uh, doc player, and I've watched a few things. Um, some of the big films weren't on the player yet, so I haven't seen them. I'm desperate to see the Werner Herzog film that Mark commissioned um, with his new best friend, Werner, <laughs> and um, the Weinstein film and various other things. So um, I'm going to hope that they come up on the doc player and watch them when they come out in the cinema or wherever they will appear. Do we have uh, any other questions from the audience? The man, I think. Me, no, Sorry. Sorry. Hello. You, yes. <laughs> I've got the mic, I'm asking. Um, so when someone comes to you with an idea and sends you an email, at what stage of their career would you take them seriously? Can they be completely fresh? Or, and would they get more support if they are starting from scratch? Or do they have to have a body of work behind them that you kind of know of already? Who's that question to? Um, Shahinda? Uh, I will, um, the reason why our email addresses are all on the website and, you know, I'm happy to take tweets or anything is because I actually genuinely think a brilliant idea could come from anywhere. So age is no barrier and of course we <laughs> love younger people <laughs> on Channel 4 uh, being the uh, youngest um, mainstream channel in, in the country. Um, so yeah, I will read anyone's email. That's not to say I will like fall in love with the idea, but I'm happy to read and reply to anything from anyone. What about you, Mark? What's your? Yeah, I mean, we give lots of opportunities, as I said earlier, to to people starting out making short form, mostly for digital, which we often um, put in. You know, we will will box up and put on as 60 minute kind of compilations on BBC Four. So there are opportunities. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time making longer form stuff. But, uh, and I think the question that we're looking at is how best to sort of offer a bit of a pathway from those two to five, seven minute pieces and the half hours and hours. But, um, you know, BBC Four is definitely a place where you can, you know, get opportunities. We use a lot of new directors for things. So um, you often get teamed up with execs and uh, companies that, uh, that we've worked with before so that we have a sense of what we might be in store for. So, so there are a few kind of safety nets we can provide. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, do we have time for one more question? Do we have any? Yeah. The Is the microphone going to you? Yeah, I've got it. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Um, it's actually another question for Shaminda. Oh, um, my God, what have I done wrong? <laughs> I'll have to ban <laughs> questions for Shaminda. I think we need to ban <laughs> Shaminda. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, so you obviously commissioned programmes for Channel 4. Yes. I was just wondering if there's any scope for documentaries going on E4 or maybe more for as well? Um, so, yes, is the answer. Um, the m 
majority of the art sort of programs or really anything I've committed has been on Channel 4. Some I have commissioned some things for more for. More for at the moment is concentrating on um, slightly different types of programs. A lot of them are kind of action and access and history type pieces. It's not to say that won't necessarily change. E4 is in a really interesting evolution at the moment because Carl Warner has taken off this year as the new head of E4 and he's having a big think, I think, about uh, what he wants factual programs to look like on E4. And you can have a look at some of the amazing broadcast pieces that have been written about his vision for E4. Um, he hasn't commissioned any art pieces yet, but I'm hoping to sort of, if any of you have any brilliant ideas, to go and bang on his door and see if we can find a home for them on E4. But definitely, sorry, I didn't mention that earlier, but, you know, big question for all of us is, as in with all TV generally, how are we going to make younger people engage with our programmes with all the changes we know are happening? And so if anyone has got ideas of sort of in the world that we're talking about that would work or you think would work for younger audiences, I'd love to hear about those because that's obviously a huge challenge for us. Thank you. Do we have time for one more question? One more. Do we have one more question? No, no. This side. Hi, um, is it on? Yeah, um, my name's Tom, I'm a DOP. My question's for Mark. Um, so if I go onto Arena's website, it's going to say this episode's not currently available. Yeah. Um, so this is like, it's, it's a mad issue because it's, it's a really like 1970s kind of <laughs> way of being because we've <laughs> moved on. If I want to watch the Blackpool Doc, I've just heard about it now. I can go and watch it on Vice now, and I can watch it for eternity. I know it's not your fault; it's to do with rights and stuff like that. But you're going to completely and utterly lose the kids if you can't <laughs> fix that problem. And also, it's part of our taxpaying money. If I want to watch the Rodney P documentary, can I find it right now? No, mm. because they buried the thing. Yeah. Now, so if you're like Bob Dylan album that came out in the '60s, I can still buy it. I can go to a museum and look at a painting from the 1600s. So we working in this art form. And we're throwing it all away in terms of BBC Docs. And it's sad because it's part of our, it's like the kids need to watch these programmes like the Rodney P one. It's part of our heritage, man, you know, and we're trashing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> and unfortunately, <laughs> and, and <laughs> Mark, and then, well, what, what yeah, Mark said is well, okay. he wants to make films that last for the yeah, future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. they are. Can, you, can, you, can, can you fix fault. the iPlayer, Mark? I, 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 we are, <laughs> I cannot single handedly fix the problem with the iPlayer. The iPlayer is limited to the number of titles it can carry at the moment by license. We are working on it. I mean, people on a, you know, further up the food chain than me are working on it. And hopefully, across the summer, we'll be looking at loosening the license on iPlayer. There's all sorts of reasons why it's the way it is. Sometimes, back in the 70s, people, you know, the iPlayer didn't exist, nor did SPOD. So clearing those films that were made then on contracts that weren't for perpetuity, weren't for uh, as yet non-invented sort of platform, guess what? It's quite hard sometimes to clear this stuff. So we're doing our best. We do make things available when we can. There are quite a lot of 70s docs on, the, on there now, on the uh, arena, you know, under the arena banner now. We're hopefully through the summer. We're looking to... We're hoping to get to a point where we uh, start being able to extend the iPlayer license. It's not going to be in perpetuity. We were able to put Civilizations up for a year, for instance. So, you know, that gives more people more opportunity to watch things for longer. It's a problem. You know, it's a problem for us. It's a, you know, quite often we also make films that, you know, go to Westford after they've been on, on the BBC because they've been co-funded by other platforms. Sometimes the budget's too big for us. And so, you know, there's all sorts of reasons. And but I apologise, though. Thank you, Martin. And if yeah, in the we made in the a meantime, really good film that should be back on, shouldn't it? The alternativity. Yeah, that that was not available on the on the. Uh, iPlayer Bible currently, now. no. But just to make it uh, to end on a positive note, if anyone wants to see <laughs> That's a Rodney, a good story for if anyone wants to see any of the Rodney P films, email me and I'll send you the Vimeo link. <laughs> so, thank you, everyone, for coming today. Thank you to our panel, um, Katie, Minda, Mark, and Alex.